come with standing there's no space that's near and the one thing only that audiences and media popularity eventually led to a residency at Mangles, a small folk club in central Johannesburg. At one of his performances, Roger was approached by a journalist of Voice of America. Over 20 years later, Roger returned to the site to tell the story. It was right here that um, the correspondent, whose name I've forgotten, from Voice of America, came and did his little interview, you know, here amongst the potatoes and the onions and the, you know, the plates and cups and saucers and um, it, yeah it was uh, it was you know that I suppose that in a, in a funny way was like it was to be a turning point of you know, of things to come as time would tell this short interview would lead to dire consequences in early 1979 independent label third ear music recorded Roger's first album the road is much longer it included some of the politically powerful songs for which he'd become notorious. Only a few independent record shops stocked the album. It was also submitted to the government-controlled South African Broadcasting Corporation, who refused to play it for political reasons. The SABC's complete monopoly of the local airwaves meant that most South Africans would not hear the music. Paul escalated his attempts to stop his music. In 1979, Mangles was Roger's favorite place to play. Today, it's a popular takeaway restaurant. It was supposed to be just another night at Mangles for Roger. But for Paul, it was the night he and a security branch colleagues decided to change tactics from harassment to sabotage. Storms and fires have come. Good can of pain and doubt. I mean, the whole place was much, much darker for one thing. It was, you know, gloomy and there were candles on the tables. This was where the stage was. And it was a tiny little stage, but it was fairly high. So if you stood up, you had to kind of watch that you didn't bump your nut. Or tall guitar players had to kind of like sort of sit down. We'd invariably end up at four o'clock in the police pub. We'd have quite a lot to drink. And of course, that provided a lot of uh, so-called Dutch courage as well. You could gauge your performance, you know, as you were going along, you could see people you know, becoming connected to you, or if you if you were losing them, you know, you could feel them coming on the journey with you. It was the sort of hidden side of, of the security branch was these, as I referred to them, nocturnal activities, you know, throwing bricks through windows, burning out cars, um, shotgunning people's homes, um, putting tear gas in, in air conditioners. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, you couldn't squeeze into this place. You know, Friday nights, Saturday nights were absolutely packed. Well, that particular night, I would have driven out to I don't remember the times. Um, my instructions been given to me earlier that day to um, trash Roger, stop this filth. Um, the stairs behind us, you know, would be, you could just, I mean, it was, it was really difficult to get to the stage. You know, people would like pass my guitar, you know, from one person to the next and I could squeeze through. It was, it was really, really awesome. And I do remember parking somewhere in the alleyway and uh, the Soweto guys had the tear gas crystals and we made a joint decision as the first sort of part of trashing Roger was to chuck it, disrupt the show by chucking it into the air conditioner. Um, with the sort of oppressive nature of, of society, I think that whole folk music clique was, an, was a, a kind of a home for, for I suppose, so-called you know, lefties at the time. This is amazing. After all these years, it's been, what, 20, 22 years, 23 years? I remember Mangles now, although it was very different to Curry Den. We were parked in this alleyway here. I suppose like, like any other night, you know, the place was packed. And um, uh, as I remember, 
I don't think I was playing at the time. I, don't, I think I was just, you know, sort of hanging around in the back here or, you know, with somebody. This would have been certainly been the place where you put it in. Yeah, this goes straight down, as I re recollect or can recall, straight down into the the hall or the area where Roger was singing. around the place was completely full and and slowly you know people sort of became aware of this you know irritant in the air and um, and suddenly there was this kind of accelerated sort of panic and everyone went racing up the stairs and and out of here our biggest thing was most of, most of these things like this one was you know in the grand scheme of things pretty like key was to avoid being caught at all costs but I also seem to remember that it's you know after a while, we, we kind of, the air cleared and we came back in. Our favorite hanging out place was the Devonshire Hotel, um, which had this, this club or this bar where a lot of the students used to hang out and play pool and drink and they'd have um, sometimes live bands or recorded music. And we'd sort of invariably end up here and at the same time, we'd enjoy ourselves. You'd always pick up snippets of information that were security relevant. Paul's activities did not stop with the tear gassing of Mangles. He waged a strategic campaign to shut down Roger's career. Roger's telephone was monitored, as were other people um, in the industry that, or in the, the segment that, that he was part of. So we, we knew after that there were shows coming up or he'd been booked or um, he was going to appear at, at whatever place. And it was a simple matter then of, of using this incident um, as a sort of threatening stick with the next venue. If you let that bastard Lucy, that terrorist Lucy, play again, we're going to blow the place up. Soon after the tear gas event, Roger went overseas for a few months. When he returned, he found that Paul's threats to venue owners had taken effect. He formed the highly acclaimed Zub Zub Marauders and set about securing live gigs. In 1981, a student documentary crew interviewed a frustrated and disillusioned Lucy. Just the bands playing around Joburg, who've all, you know, done really good singles or good albums that are, you know, are worthy of being played. They're not on, you know, they're not on at all. Paul again escalated his campaign. He seized Roger's records from shops. Copies of the two albums were submitted to the Directorate of Publications for banning. It became illegal to own The Road Is Much Longer. Paul warned record company reps not to touch Roger's music in the future. With almost all outlets closed to him, Roger's career was all but over. He played when he could, but he was never able to secure anything financially viable. An association with the independent Shifty Records led to the inclusion of two new songs on separate compilation albums, Forces Favourites and A Nachi in Our Society. During this time, Roger undertook a new musical venture. He formed a country band called Tighthead Faree and the Loose Forwards. You tell me that you love me still. Well, I heard those words. Paul Erasmus published his revelations in the Mail and Guardian newspaper. I'd be, been secretly, not for any other reason apart from it, was part of my therapy, or, or cathartic process, been putting things down on paper, and written this manuscript. And the advice and the, the avenue that I've decided to go down was um, to get somebody um, in the media world in a respectable public or reputable publication. And, and let the story come out. I just didn't realise what a floodgate I was actually opening at the time. I was in Grahamstown doing a show, and um, 
I met up with my old friend James Phillips in the bar after quite, you know, after we'd done, done I remember he was quite, he was quite pissed and um, I had every intention of joining him on that plateau. And as I walked in, he said, hey, Roger, he had this sort of laconic voice, you know, Roger, you didn't need those O's to stuff up your music career, he said. He said, you were doing a great job yourself. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about, James? And he showed me this this clip from this um, from the Mail and Guardian about Paul Erasmus. Paul has become a big Roger Lucy fan. He still has a record he confiscated all those years ago, and he plays it often. Um, I thought people like him were dangerous. I believed it. You know, we asked later sub subsequently said I secretly became a fan of his, was transcribing his music, sitting for hours, especially after that first Voice of America um, tape. The quality was very bad. I sat for many, many hours listening with a rewind button over and over and over and eventually the music sort of started to get to me, so I enjoyed it. And then later on when I um, confiscated the, the batch of records and tapes, I used to play it regularly. Um, Especially, I think, in sort of depressing moments, you know. What was happening in the country wasn't lost on, on all of us. I mean, we weren't totally immune. Longer than ever before. 